Hi everyone, welcome to our lecture today on the nutrient cycles. Uh, so when we had our introduction to ecology last week, I mentioned that part of what makes an ecosystem is not only the living things inside of the ecosystem, but also the non-living things. Uh, and what we're going to go through today are three of the main cycles of how those non-living elements in an, uh, an ecosystem get cycled around and how it's important to keep an ecosystem going and really keep our planet going. Uh, there are um, three of them. We're going to go through the water cycle, which you probably learned in middle school, so that one should be review for you. The nitrogen cycle, which is, in my opinion, the most complicated of the three. And then the carbon cycle, which you'll recognize a lot of the elements from that particular cycle from stuff we've learned this year. All right, so let's get started here. First, um, just the cycles in general. There's often or sometimes called the biogeochemical bio cycles. And this is, again, anything non-living that is being cycled around through an ecosystem. So from the sky to the organisms that live within that ecosystem, uh, into the ground and back around all over again. All right, so let's start with the water cycle. So the water cycle is, uh, it functions to continuously move water from the atmosphere, you know, the sky, to the land, to the oceans, and back again. All right. So we see it. Uh, we see the water cycle when we see rain falling. We're getting to summertime, right, where we have a lot of those thunderstorms. So you'll see that more and more. Uh, the water gets soaked in by the ground where either organisms will consume it or it will evaporate and go back up into the atmosphere. And since there's a, it's a cycle, there's no technical starting point, um, but we're going to start with the atmosphere. So this is what the water cycle looks like. You probably recognize some of the elements here from uh, middle school, I would imagine you do. Um, we're going to start in the sky or in the atmosphere. The first thing that happens, remember this is a cycle so there's no starting point, but the first thing we're starting with here is uh, when water vapor condenses in the, uh, in the cool air of the sky and that is how you see clouds. Clouds are essentially just water that's trapped. Um, and even if the, you don't see clouds, there's still water in the sky. So when enough of that water accumulates in the atmosphere, in the clouds, um, once it gets too heavy, it will fall down to the earth in the form of rain or the technical term, right, precipitation. Once the rain starts falling, uh, it can do a couple things. One, it can become runoff where it will flow down uh, from the highest points of the earth where it hits, so like mountaintops, things of that nature. Uh, it will flow down and it will accumulate uh, once it does, once it flows down mountains, surfaces of land, it will accumulate in lakes, oceans, rivers, things like that. Uh, if it doesn't accumulate there, it can also soak down into the soil. Uh, that's called percolation and it will get absorbed down there and become what they call groundwater. And here's the groundwater in the picture here. All right, so once that water has collected, um, if it's not consumed by organisms, it will be heated up by the sun and it will re-enter the atmosphere as evaporation, right? You know that if you leave you know, a cup of water out long enough, eventually the water level goes down. Why? Because the water is turning from liquid to gas. And that's what evaporation is, and it's re-entering the atmosphere. Water can also evaporate from trees and plants through a process called transpiration. We talk about that in AP Biology if you're taking that class next year. Um, but that's when essentially plants release water vapor. You might remember seeing that from the photosynthesis stuff we learned about this year. Um, animals, of course, release water vapor when we sweat. Uh, when we breathe, we release water vapor, things like that. So here's our water cycle. There's your evaporation, condensation, precipitation, runoff, percolation if it collects in the ground, and then flows into our bodies of water, and the cycle starts all over again. All right, so that's your water cycle. Pretty straightforward. Again, you probably remember most of it from middle school. So now we're going to start, now we're going to get into the nitrogen cycle. I think the nitrogen cycle is, again, the most complicated of the three. Um, we're going to do an activity tomorrow and into next week that goes through the nitrogen cycle because there's kind of a lot to digest. So I think the more practice with this one will help. Nitrogen uh, has to be cycled, just like water has to be cycled. There's a lot of nitrogen in our atmosphere. I don't know if you knew that or not. They say about 78% of our atmosphere is made up of nitrogen gas or N2. Um, but what's important about this is that we can't use N2. We can't uh, inhale it. We can't use it for anything. It has to be converted 
into other forms of nitrogen that can be used by plants and animals. And we'll look at how that works. And remember that we need nitrogen. Nitrogen is in our DNA, right? Those nitrogenous bases, adenine, thymine, cytosine, guanine, right? They're also in proteins. Every, you know, that was an indicator of what a, a protein was. Remember we had the molly mods. We used the blue pieces to build our amino acids. I know that seems like a while ago, but um, nitrogen is important for a lot of the biological molecules that make up life. So it has to be cycled. It circulates from the air to the soil, to the water and the organisms within ecosystems. So here is what the nitrogen cycle looks like. We're gonna go through all the phases here. A lot of big words on the screen can be a little intimidating. A lot of the work done by the nitrogen cycle or done for the nitrogen cycle is actually done by bacteria. Um, and we're not gonna get into the details of how they do these things because that's not important for your purposes, but a lot of the conversions of the different types of nitrogen are done by bacteria. So let's go through and talk about these different types or different things in the nitrogen cycle. The first thing that happens is, or where we're starting from the atmosphere, is nitrogen fixation. So if you remember the word fixation from, we talked about carbon fixation uh, earlier in the year with uh, cellular respiration, you may remember. So one of the things that has to happen is this N2, I mentioned it can't be used by organisms, has to be converted into a form that can be used by organisms. So nitrogen fixation, the word fixation in biology means to take something from a non-usable form and make it usable. So there are bacteria on the earth that can convert this form of nitrogen in the atmosphere, N2, into ammonia, NH3. The conversion of these molecules um, is one now that organisms can use, is NH3. So there are nitrogen fixing bacteria that live in the soil. They are the ones, they usually live in the roots of different kinds of plants, like in the picture here. They are the ones that absorb that nitrogen and use it and convert it into ammonia. <clears throat> so once you have your ammonia, you can have uh, it from animal waste, decaying bodies. That ammonia gets uh, returned to the soil by bacteria and different decomposers. We talked about that. So this bunny here in the picture, if it were to die, right? We did watch a video of a decaying bunny last week. Um, if it were to die, the nitrogen in its body would be broken down by decomposers. If it released waste, the nitrogen in that would be broken down by decomposers. And those decomposers are going to transform it into this ammonia or NH3, like in the picture down here, okay? After that, once you have your ammonia in the soil, it'll undergo a process called nitrification, where it's converted to nitrate and then nitrite. Uh, I'm sorry, nitrate and then nitrate. If you uh, are in chemistry this year, you remember from chemistry last year, your polyatomic ions, right? The, the eights have more oxygen than the ites. You might remember that. Hopefully you do. Polyatomic ions ringing a bell. Um, but anyway, not super important for our purposes, but um, this is the process that converts that ammonia to nitrates, like in the picture here. Assimilation is the next part of the cycle. This is when uh, the plants absorb the nitrogen in the soil. So they're absorbing those nitrates and it's they go up through their roots, right? And in, they become part of the plant. They become incorporated into the plant's cellular structure. And then if an animal, like an herbivore, were to come along and eat that plant, that nitrogen within the plant becomes part of the animal's body. Another process here that can happen is denitrification. So if those nitrates are not uh, taken in by a plant or if they're not consumed by an animal, they can be ch uh, changed from this NO3 form by denitrifying bacteria. So again, we see another kind of bacteria that will transform or convert this NO3 back into NH or N2, and it will return to the atmosphere to start the cycle all over again. All right, so that's the nitrogen cycle. Um, again, you're gonna do an activity tomorrow and into next week, I think, that will give you more insight as to how the nitrogen cycle works. I know it seems kind of complicated and there's a lot to it, words that are brand new to you. And then finally, we're gonna wrap up today with the carbon cycle. So the carbon cycle is really critical for all life on Earth. We know that all living organisms, all living things on the planet, right, are carbon-based. We talked about that this year. Carbon is that, you know, atom that ha can make four bonds, Lots of valence electrons, really important. We talked about all that with our biological molecule stuff this year. Carbs, lipids, proteins, right? 
uh, nucleic acids. So water, just like water has to be cycled, carbon has to be cycled, and it's done in the carbon cycle. Again, very similar to the nitrogen cycle, it's transforming from non-living to living things and back again. This is what the carbon cycle looks like. You should recognize a couple words here from previous learning in the year, photosynthesis, cellular respiration. Um, so we're going to go through and talk about this. We're going to start in the atmosphere like we have for the two other uh, cycles. In our atmosphere, we have carbon dioxide, right, CO2. Um, this can not be uh, inhaled or consumed by us, right, animals, um, but it can be used by autotrophs. CO2 gets absorbed into we'll say plants, right? And other autotrophs could be uh, bacteria, different things like that, protists. But they are taking in that carbon dioxide and they're converting it into sugars like glucose. And then the glucose can be all put together to make big polysaccharides like starch. And that's photosynthesis. You should recognize that. So here's our carbon dioxide in the atmosphere being absorbed by our photosynthesizers. Once that happens, uh, if an animal were to come along and eat one of those photosynthesizers, they will then consume the sugars and starches that were made by that plant. And we know that sugar like glucose, right, C6, H12O6, you remember that? So you got carbon in those sugars. They'll be consumed by the animals. The animals will use that C6, H12O6 in cellular respiration to make ATP in the mitochondria. You should remember all that from this year. Um, and then... <clears throat> That energy of metabolism, once they make that CO2, or once they make that ATP, remember that CO2 is a waste product of cellular respiration. So the animals will release that CO2 back into the atmosphere uh, as a byproduct of cellular respiration. So as you breathe, right, not you, this deer in the picture, any organism um, that is not an autotroph, so any heterotrophs are releasing carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. So... At some point, <laughs> spoiler alert, right? everything that is living has to die. So when those organisms die, their bodies are broken down by decomposers. And decomposers release the carbon from their bodies. And it will go into the soil. And it will eventually get um, made into fossil fuels like oil. That takes millions of years to happen. Um, but that's where we get a lot of our oil from is... Um, essentially dead organisms that have spent many, many years under the earth, under extreme amounts of pressure, um, and that carbon gets transformed into what we call fossil fuels or uh, things like oil or gasoline. All right, and then um, we take those fossil fuels like oil or gasoline, right? We put them in our cars, we put them in boats, airplanes, right? And we burn that gasoline or that carbon, and that process is called combustion. You may have heard that before. That's going to release the carbon dioxide then back into the atmosphere. And with that combustion, um, you can have a lot of it or too much of it, right? And that's how we get things like our climate change that we've been experiencing uh, as more carbon dioxide goes into the atmosphere. Carbon dioxide is what they call a greenhouse gas. So when it gets, there's too much of it in the atmosphere, uh, it creates kind of like a warm blanket around the surface of the earth and it's causing it to have this sort of heating up effect, kind of like a greenhouse would. Have you ever been in a greenhouse, right? That's where they keep plants, little glass building. It's very warm in there. Kind of that same effect, which is why uh, the earth is heating up um, because of too much releasing of those fossil fuels and the carbon dioxide back into the atmosphere. Uh, and if we had more time and we were in school, we would spend a, a nice chunk of the ecology unit talking about human impact on the environment. But unfortunately, we're running out of time here. Um, but needless to say, this is the carbon cycle. Um, and that's it for today. So I hope everybody enjoys the rest of their Wednesday.